hotel. The street lamp, the silk blue sky, the shiny column of the hotel entrance. The reflection of the buildings in the window of the flower shop. The shop interior, which is almost totally wiped out by the reflection. The pot of rhododendron on the string wall. Everything is so uniform that no one object can be seen as the focal point. The whole painting is the focal point. What then is so remarkable about it all? The following draw our attention. The motif of the reflection in the shop window. The rhododendron pot as still life. The almost complete absence of people. The uniform, almost excessive clarity of the painting. The reflection catches our attention first but it is also a compositional device by counterbalancing the sweep of the road with the barrier-like building complex in the background. The curve of the street lamp guides the viewer's gaze into the main area of the picture, while the reflection introduces a different, a reduced aspect of reality into the painting. Mirrors reflect visible reality, but it remains intangible and whilst the reflection is completely accurate, it is also back to front, and therefore completely inaccurate. The pot of rhododendrons sits exactly on the vertical axis of the picture, and as there are no people, it takes on a still life quality. The uniform clarity of the picture taxes the eyes and makes the viewer aware of the process of seeing, seeing as a physical sensation with the recognition of objects less important than the seeing itself. We perceive the painting as a structure, one which is arbitrary, segmented, and has no single focus of interest. The foreground and middle ground are predominantly dark. The background is predominantly bright. The darker areas form an internal frame whilst the brighter areas form a picture within a picture. The two stand on either side of the axes, creating a vacuum in the center. There, the legibility of concrete objects is impaired by the rapid foreshortening. The dark stringboard in the foreground, with its rectangular shape and its smooth, flat structure, acts through its size and proportion, both as an intimation of and a contrast to the bright buildings behind, with their varied, irregular, jutting outline. Depth and width balance each other out. The sharpness and precision of detail is evenly distributed over the whole painting. No single color predominates. Rather, we are presented with a carefully chosen range of muted and interrelated hues. The exaggerated uniform clarity emphasizes and intensifies the fact that the picture is a carefully balanced and thought out composition in which the perceived data are at the same time abstract data. Thus, the picture harks back to a period before Kandinsky, who in his paintings had moved away from representational painting, a move which has been seen as both the bane and boon of modern art ever since. This return to representational art is all the more remarkable as it goes hand in hand with a hyper-realistic style of depicting reality, which is only to be found in photography with its sharply focused precision. Photography was indeed used by the artist, the American Richard Estes, as the basis for his painting, Ansonia, from 1977. This method of realistic painting, making a painting resemble the impression of a sharply focused photograph, came into vogue in the United States in the late 60s, and soon spread to Europe. The name given to this style was photorealism. Photorealism is the culmination of a dream of 19th century naturalistic art. A painting is made to take on the appearance of a photograph, combining concrete representational elements 
with non-representational, purely pictorial elements. Photorealism, or superrealism, is, however, not naturalism. Its aim is to generate an acute sense of unreality by presenting its subject with hallucinatory particularity. Richard Estes' painting, Ansonia, however, is not based on one photograph, but two. The artist took them himself in the area of New York where he lived. The dark foreground shows a view from 71st Street, the brighter background from 69th Street. The picture only appears to be true to life, when in fact it isn't. It is based on two photographs joined together. It is therefore a copy of a copy of unconnected reality. The reflection in the shop window takes this process one step further. It is the inversion of a copy of a copy of a copy. Estes' work seems preoccupied with perspective illusionism and with the complex play between reflective surfaces. The apparent reality which the artist seems at such great pains to evoke, vanishes. And it is with photography that Estes is able to make his point. A photograph reproduces indiscriminately every detail of each object as it appears at the time of exposure. This lack of discrimination negates any possible hierarchy which might exist between the objects. Each object and each area of the picture is of equal importance, reproduced with minute exactitude. This idea had first been developed by the American action painter Jackson Pollock some 25 years earlier. Pollock had completely abandoned the traditional ideas of composition, of the painting having a center, top and bottom, giving every part of the canvas the same value as every other part. The term used to describe this style is all over painting. Richard Estes' Ansonia seems to contradict itself. It seems to be a photograph, but it is a painting. It seems to be representational, but it is abstract. How can these contradictions be reconciled? As Estes himself says, with taste. And he proclaims it within the painting. On the side of the bus, we see what looks like an advertising slope. Taste is everything. But taste, like most things, is a double-edged sword. Artist Joseph Stella, who came from Italy but had been living in the United States since the turn of the century, painted this almost 180 centimeter high picture in 1939. He called it the Brooklyn Bridge, variations on an old theme. This is the fifth version out of a series of six with this bridge motif, painted by Stella between 1917 and 1941. The Brooklyn Bridge is as much a symbol of New York as the skyscrapers. It stretches across the East River, connecting Manhattan and Brooklyn. It is as fascinating to Americans as the Rialto Bridge in Venice is to Italians, or the bridge over the River Kölbrand is to the people of Hamburg. After the unexpected death of the architect, John A. Roebling, during the final surveyor work, his son, Washington Roebling carried on the work his father had begun in 1867, constructing the bridge according to his plan. It was completed in May 1883 and ceremoniously opened to traffic by the then American president, Arthur Chester. The carriageway, which is more than a thousand meters long, and the wooden pedestrian walkway running overhead, hang by steel ropes from two massive, towering stone pylons. It held its title as the longest suspension bridge in the world for 20 years, before being beaten by another bridge. An amazing record. Until a few decades ago, when steamships still sailed from Europe to America, 
It appeared, together with the skyscrapers, to the new arrivals, much as recorded in this photo by the German architect, Erich Mendelssohn. Colossal pylons and buildings thrusting straight up at the sky must have made an especially powerful impression after the continuous flat horizon of gaze at sea. But Brooklyn Bridge is not only impressive from a distance. The pedestrian walkway laid out with boards above the traffic also allows us to get closer. This closeness comes across in a picture composed of a large number of individual photos taken by the British painter and photographer David Hockney on the bridge in November 1982. The component photos lead the viewer's gaze from the artist's feet up to the network of steel cables and the big stone pylon in a wide sweep that takes in every aspect of the view from the bottom to the top. Up here on the pedestrian walkway, we are treated to a close-up of the bridge and at the same time to a dizzying view of New York. Joseph Stella combined both these impressions in his painting. He takes us up to the top of the bridge where we can see the bridge itself in close-up and the skyscraper. And at the same time, we have a view from the distance resembling a postcard. But both views are depicted in such a way as to make the bridge seem like an emblem, almost like a coat of arms. What distinguishes a coat of arms is its stylized character. And in fact, the bridge is so highly stylized that only our understanding of the way it fits together allows us to recognize its concrete features. To describe the details of the sites on offer at all adequately, we need to adopt an expressionistic style. Then we might say something like this. Light blue, rising. Steep descent, central position, spreading out into other light colors. Tugging elephants' trunks dangling, reflected in front of black Gothic's double portal. Scaffolding pushes obliquely, climbing black from red over yellow and blue, forming pyramid and towering construction, bundle of light beams. Velvet blue, riveted with stars. Auxiliary yellow accompanies a long border. Again, velvet blue nestles darkly in fans of black. Yellow windows in high-rise mountain range under descending arc of red, blue, yellow color ferry, backed up by steel harp of bridge. Rolling rhythm of ball bearing chain, scooting over rail of teeth. These are the sort of words evoked by this towering picture. But what artistic methods are used to achieve such thorough stylization? And what effect do they have? Strict symmetry an emphasis on vertical lines, and a reduced palette consisting of the primary colors red, blue, and yellow. Added to this, the inclusion of green, violet, and orange as the complements to the three primary colors, plus the artist's refusal to show the difference between material, stone, and steel, and the division of the canvas into two zones, the view on the bridge itself and the view of the bridge, together with the pattern, reminiscent of a woodcut, that pervades the black and white picture. The combination of all these things makes the painting more than just another impressive view of the bridge. What it reveals is inaccessible to a mere casual or sweeping glance. The picture, like the bridge, can only be perceived as something that has been carefully set up. Rather than the moment of seeing the bridge, it represents the cumulative experience of it over a length of time. To make this seen and felt, the picture crowds and compresses its subjects to bring out its essence. And this makes it more than just a symbol or a coat of arms. It also shows us a construction that carries massive weight on the elastic swing of its towering bulk. It presents the bridge as a monument, a tribute to a civilization inspired and dominated by technology. 
or in the words of Erich Mendelssohn, herald of the new land, of freedom, and the immeasurable wealth lying behind it. The most adventurous exploitation, gold diggers, and world domination. Joseph Stella's painting achieves all this with artistic methods used in a controlled way that is easy to follow. He uses a simple composition that stresses steepness and symmetry, and a palette reduced to the most basic colors. And a spatial arrangement of the motifs that attracts and holds the viewer's attention, fixed on the center of the picture through the mirror image swing of the steel cables and the double window shape of the stone pylon. In this way, the picture thrives on the pathos of the sort engendered by an old altarpiece, which is just what it aspires to be, an altarpiece for a heroic age in human history. That this was the intention of the artist, who died in 1946, is clear from a text which he wrote about the Brooklyn Bridge. After a vivid passage describing his experience of the bridge, an experience filled with darkness, loneliness, plunging light, muffled sound, and the pulse of the city, the text concludes with this exclamation. I was profoundly moved, as if on the threshold of a new religion or in the presence of a new divinity. At first glance, this seems to be no more than a highly realistic painting, almost a mere snapshot of the reality we see all around us in big cities. A cinema entrance on a corner, complete with posters and pictures of the stars. A box office and cashier, people buying tickets or simply standing around. They are gathered in and around a somewhat pompous building whose architecture plainly derives from opera houses or theatres. But the rows of lights strung around the curved ceiling add a touch of the circus or music hall. In the background, we find the foyer, decorated with gilded female statues, a cinema of the 30s. The title of the painting, 20 Cent Movie. The shop assistant. Laborers and office workers come here after work looking for entertainment and diversion, trying to forget the shabbiness and tawdriness of city life. They are hoping to lose themselves in a world which does not exist in their reality, drawn by this doorway, glittering in the night with its artificial light. Street light, a scene from the sidewalk of a big city. Street life captured by the perceptive eye of the artist, painted in egg tempera on a canvas one meter wide. The painter is the American Reginald Marsh, 38 years old in 1936 when he made this picture. His studio was in Manhattan on 14th Street, a rather sleazy, run-down area. This is where he found most of his subjects. The 20 cent movie, however, is based on the Lyric Theatre on 42nd Street. Paintings like this give us a coherent view of what life was like then in the New York of the 30s. This is the time after the Great Depression, the time of returning prosperity, the time of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, a program of reforms designed to overcome the economic crisis. This New Deal also included an employment scheme for artists, and Reginald Marsh, too, got commissions in this way. The cinema provides the crowds, breathing softly in the dark, with flickering black and white vision. The entrance to the cinema is the gateway to a movie heaven, to one and a half hours of happiness and escape. Reginald Marsh saw this and captured it. The characters, men and women alike, 
to make an appearance here. The architecture, with its lights enticingly illuminating the night. The advertisement, whose pictures and words leap out as passers-by. Consumerism incarnate. Individual words and fragments of phrases stand out on the cinema's facade, like newspaper headlines. The word now is repeated, electrifying the moment, without lending it any meaning. Then the names of the stars, Frederick March and Anna Stern, as well as Leo Carrillo, whose blown-up photos form a triptych above the box office and the entrance. Finally, words to excite, seduce, advertise. Stripped bare. A love written in blood. Joys of the flesh. The same or similar words can still be seen today, every day, on the many cinemas in midtown Manhattan. As we said, at first glance, a very realistic picture, like a snapshot of the reality the painter saw. But the picture has more to show. The techniques used, color, line, contrast of light and dark, the composition, are all rather simple. A sketchy reporting style predominates. But it is precisely this which allows the reality of the situation to come across without becoming either cluttered or edited. Thus, this reality, rather than the artist's interpretive skill, becomes the artistic event. But what is so interesting about this banal reality? Does it contain anything that Reginald Marsh emphasized and brought to the fore, as he and his true-to-life fellow artists in America or Europe did? Let us look at a few examples. The painting Subway by George Tooker uses a low ceiling a cramping perspective, depressed expressions and restrained gestures to create an atmosphere full of inhibition and anxiety. Edward Hopper's painting Nighthawks gives us a glance into a bar at night. Here the prevailing mood is one of exhaustion, lack of fulfillment, inability to communicate, isolation after a pointless day of work. Or, moving to Europe, George Gross's dedication to Oscar Panizza. A demonic, turbulent crowd moves along a street full of frightening, leaning and oppressive facades. And Otto Dix, in his painting Big City, manages to unmask a banal, everyday reality by selecting and arranging his subjects, filtering and compressing to turn the street into an exhibition of all that is objectionable. Hopper said about his Nighthawks, unconsciously, probably, I was painting the loneliness of a large city. The artist's perception and understanding of the world are forced on the observer. To this end, reality becomes stylized, displaced, twisted, compressed. These are all legitimate means of depiction and interpretation, used here in an especially forceful way. Not so Reginald March, who had been trained as an illustrator and was one of the original staff members of the New Yorker. His style is consistently detached and exact, like a reporter, yet he still brings something to the fore. It is not so much the technique, but the subject matter. It is the allegorical within reality which is accessible to a perceptively employed eye or camera. The allegorical element here lies in the presentation of a real cinema entrance as a world stage, complete with above and below, lead roles and extras. The lead actors are emphasized by their pose, facing the viewer, the woman in the white suit, the black man with his hat cheekily resting on his ear, the man with his hands in his pockets. They stare at us from the picture, watching us. They are concerned about their appearances. 
Their gestures and posture imitate their idols in the movie heaven. This cross-referencing above and below is accompanied by a cross-referencing right and left in the positioning of the stars and the advance notices. Frederick March, whose poster appears on the left, can be seen on the right. Leo Carrillo, seen on the right, appears in the advance notice on the left. This interlinkage in the upper part of the picture is discarded below. Instead, women on the left are opposed to men on the right. This is an allusion to the perpetually recurring theme of all B movies, boy meets girl. Seen in this way, the picture is far more than a faithful depiction of reality. It becomes a visual epitome of real life with all its many tensions. This painting depicts a large white flower, no more. It takes up the entire canvas. The picture is almost one meter wide, and its format makes it appear like a poster of the huge flower. The flower occupies the center of the picture, emphasizing it, and in turn being emphasized itself by its placing. The petals form a detached whirlpool shape, spinning around the cluster of stamens, spreading out to the edges of the painting and then reforming as a garland of white leaves. The depiction of the flower is bound up with a vibrant abstract pattern of soft curves, detached sweets, and undulating bands. This pattern is devoid of straight lines. There is nothing here to evoke rulers, drawing boards, or technical draftsmanship. There are only flowing curves, floating strokes, and organic shapes. This brings to mind concepts such as organic nature and growth, vitality and capacity for renewal, youth, beauty, and innocence. The pattern develops out of the concrete representation of the flower's petals, and as such, makes use of them to bring out a point, a natural principle. The way the flower is depicted turns it into an epitome of growing, blossoming nature, the embodiment of beauty and vitality. What is not intended, and therefore not depicted, is the physical splendor of the flower, the velvety skin of the petals, their glowing tone hovering between light and shade, and the fragrance of their colors. Of course, all this is conjured up and can hardly be avoided when one thinks of flowers or paints a picture such as this. But this is played down by an approach that uses the flower motif to illustrate a principle, and stresses that in the way it portrays its concrete features. The result is that, in this picture, we do not so much admire this particular flower. Rather, we marvel at the creative power of nature that comes across through the flower. Thus, our admiration is directed at a natural principle. To this end, the picture is semi-abstract. This suggests a very modern approach is not all painting concerned with more than the simple depiction of a motif. Surely there is always more to be discerned than the bare reality of the subject matter. To be sure, in the 19th century naturalist school, there were variations on a form of representation purporting to be a pure motif, excluding everything else. This comes across most clearly in the paintings of the Austrian Ferdinand Georg Waldmüller. He made painting the art of describing nothing but what is really there. A preoccupation he shared with 17th century Dutch flower painters. Their work seemed to be no more than a hymn of praise to the simple beauty that one sees in nature. Ambrosius Boschart, for instance, painted this eternally fresh bouquet of flowers that would never wilt around 1619. But this is just the point. These thoughts of unwilting nature 
imply the experience of the transience of real flowers, and thus one of the main internal themes of painting in that period, the notion of vanitas. But, as we shall see, this idea is also borne out by the painting of the big white flower. It's by the American artist, Georgia O'Keeffe, who painted it in 1931. At that time, she used to spend each summer in New Mexico in the American Midwest. There, she was enchanted by the austere beauty of the landscape and inspired by every detail of this untamed natural life. She summed up these impressions in a painting entitled Summer Day, which became very famous. A stag's antlers and skull, with aster, cactus and sunflower blossoms as a vision above a heroic landscape. Georgia O'Keeffe created whole cycles of large format flower paintings here, using her frequently semi-abstract style to pay homage to the primitive beauty and creative power of nature. These paintings seem almost like lost notices in a newspaper, portraying as they do an elemental nature, long since lost to city dwellers. But our picture breaks with this pattern. It is entitled the white calico flower. That is, not a real flower, but one made of white cotton fabric. Such artificial flowers, no matter how beautiful and true to life, were in fact used at funerals for coffin decoration. A flower for the dead, then. A reminder of the transience of flowers and human beings alike. And yet flowers such as this, and also this picture, exhibit beauty and vitality. Given the inevitability of death, this is thus a comforting gesture. At the same time, the painting expresses mistrust of the initial appearances of flowers, pictures, and nature. But still, the picture takes amazement as its point of departure. Amazement when confronted with the miracle of nature and human ingenuity, which is capable of completely recreating. Naive amazement of this sort has become a rarity. It was already absent from the large flower prints created by the pop artist Andy Warhol in the mid-60s. These wallpaper white pictures, reproduced in sterile fashion from photos and brightened up with printer's inks, deal no longer with natural beauty, but rather with social models, which have turned the original into a commodity. They deal with the reduction of beauty to material objects, and no longer with beauty itself. Compared to such cool, quasi-analytical, almost cynical pictures, Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings appear truly naive, being so full of wonder. This is the same wonder with which Albrecht Dürer observed the natural world, and sketched and painted what he saw. This watercolour shows us his enchantment with the smallest detail in which the stupendous beauty and perfection of God's creation is revealed. Dürer sees this in a purely religious way, peering respectfully at this tiny bit of nature and becoming engrossed in each blade of grass. Georgia O'Keeffe views her flower irreligiously. It is not so much devotion to God but admiration of nature's omnipotence. The last example of religious awe before the beauty of creation appears in the works of the Romantic period, in this engraving of Philip Otto Runger, for instance. This constructed cornflower uses a geometric pattern to outline the otherwise humble flower. Thus, Runger, too, sees an abstract pattern behind the flower's concrete features, a design blueprint, as it were. So there is definitely some affinity between this American painter, whose work was always based closely upon natural appearances, and German Romantic art. Yet Georgia O'Keeffe's art remains irreligious, as she herself described it. A flower is relatively small, but in a certain sense, no one really examines a flower. It is so small, and we have no time to look at it. But one needs time, because it takes time to feel happiness. So, I said to myself, I am going to paint what I see, what the flower means to me. But I will paint it big, and make people take the time to look at it. I'll even make the busy New Yorkers take the time. 
To do that, Georgia O'Keeffe had to move away from the modest format of Dürer's or Runger's little pictures, which are both only a few centimeters across. She had to paint big, as big as a poster, in order to overcome the modern world's indifference to anything small. It is not a large picture, 61 centimeters high by 75 centimeters wide, an almost intimate format. But the simplicity of its style and the small number of objects make it seem larger than it really is. The picture shows a deserted landscape, stretching back to mountains on the horizon. A vast billiard table fills the landscape. It slopes upwards. Like a ramp, the green surface stretches up to a sky full of clouds. Oddly, the clouds are different colors. On the horizon are two white ones. Above them are six more, each a different color. First, the primary colors red, blue, and yellow, and then the three secondary colors, green, orange, violet. On the billiard table, we see three billiard balls, two white and one red. The corner of the table is supported by a large, fat, wooden leg. Thus far, the contents of the painting and the unusual depiction of reality. The individual components of the picture 